Hello, I'm Kendra Von Esch, and you are listening to my 10-minute daily podcast, Reality Reflections. I bought into what this world said would make me happy. Money, prestige, power, and hey, if it feels good, do it, because life is stressful, so party hard. Do whatever makes you happy. But that didn't quite work out, because I felt even more insecure, full of fear, shame and anxiety, and never, ever good enough. Then God found me and flipped my reality upside down and transformed my life. And I want this for everyone. So I left my executive career to help others find true acceptance, supernatural peace, joy, and love that only comes from a relationship with God. Here is my reality reflection for today. We really need to continue to work on ourselves. You know, when God gives me one word, one word to focus on, I've shared the one, pick up your cross daily and follow me when I was trying to get into a daily prayer life. He called me out, basically said, look, you've got to do it every day. This isn't a choice. And I remember thinking, why isn't it a choice, right? This whole free will thing. And I came to find through studying how to pray mental prayer that it isn't a choice. We will not be saved if we do not pray. That's not Kendra Von Esch telling you that. That's my saint I pray to all the time, Saint Augustine. And we are called to be saints. It's in the catechism. It's what God calls us. Be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. We know we can't be, but darn it, we better try. Because of this one word (laughs) that he was telling me in the readings today, and I'm going to read the gospel after that I truly believe fortifies this one word because we've heard this phrase, this verse so many times. But I wonder if we've really seen this word. It's the verse before the gospel, John 3.16. If you watch any sports, you've seen this out there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Might. Not that you will. Not that it's guaranteed that you might have eternal life. Might, 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 might. It's not a definitive you will. If you believe you will be saved, you will have eternal life. No. That everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. (laughs) All right, kiddos, let's get into this. Gospel 5 of John 31 through 47. Jesus said to the Jews, if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is not true. Okay, let's, I'm going to commentate as we go along here. Testimony. You got to have other people say it, right? That's why when you're in a court type of situation, you bring people to testify. And yes, you can have false witness. You can lie about that person under oath. But back then, you don't get to testify that you're God without somebody else validating that you are. Okay, but Jesus goes on to say, hey, look, if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is not true. But there is another who testifies on my behalf. And I know that the testimony he gives on my behalf is true. You sent emissaries to John and he testified to the truth. 
Meaning John said, hey, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not even worthy of tying the dude's sandals. I do not accept human testimony, but I say this so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and for a while you were content to rejoice in his light. But I gave testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father gave to me to accomplish, these works that I perform, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. Moreover, the Father who sent me has, testif has testified on my behalf. But you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, and you do not have his word remaining in you because you do not believe in the one whom has, he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think you have an eternal life through them. Even they testify on my behalf, but you do not want to come to me to have life. I do not accept human praise. Moreover, I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I came in the name of my Father, but you do not accept me. Yet if another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe when you accept praise from one another and do not seek the praise that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who will accuse you is Moses in whom you have placed your hope. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Okay, that's some serious stuff. And my whole deal is this. We can only work on ourselves. We can't change other people. We need to have our own hearts changed. Why? So that we can actually love other people exactly the way they are. Not after they make a change, not after they're apologizing to us, not after they see the light of faith, not after they believe what we've been telling them is going on in the world, not after they have a political flip, not after they have a light in their mind, show them truth about something that they've been doing. The love that we are supposed to have for others is unconditional. And the only way that we will ever be able to do that is by working on ourselves. Whether our spouse has an addiction, whether our spouse is cheating on us, whether our spouse is, is abusive, whether they don't see the world like we see, Maybe we're single and we're frustrated with a boyfriend or a girlfriend that we're involved in. We're struggling with our vocation. Is this the right person or not? Should I even get married? Maybe I should give myself to the church. Maybe you're just tired in your vocation, right? Or you're just, everything is just blasé. And you're looking for some outside something or other to give you that zeal, that burst of, of joy and peace and love and honestly satisfaction. Because the more that we ask God to come into our heart in prayer, the more that we talk to him about our pain, our anguish, our desires and our 
frustrations, right? The more that we are going to allow him in, there is actually a spirit. I've mentioned this before of a wall around your heart with certain people. And if we just worked on ourselves and stopped worrying about what everybody else is doing, even those who are closest to us, how can I be a better person today? In your state of life and in your vocation. If you're religious, how can I best pray for my brothers and sisters, depending on where you're at and what you're doing, and for the rest of the world, or if you're a priest uh, for your flock, how can I better lead them today? Maybe it's a matter of asking your parishioners what they want, what they need. Maybe you've never done that. I don't even know if that is actually something that priests ask their parishioners. What do you need <laughs> so that I can better help you on your journey? You might be surprised. It might be something like, well, I need more confession or we need more adoration or we need more. Well, you know what? All this stuff doesn't have to fall on the priest's shoulders. It can fall on the parishioners. If you're looking at blowing up adoration in your parish, well, guess what, parishioners? You guys got to stand up and sign up so that we can have it. The parish that you're in flourishes because of your participation with the pastor, right? And all of the other people that work in the office who bust their butts to try and bring enlightenment, entertainment, education, and to honestly help you with practical ways that you can deepen your relationship with God. And if you're not getting that, then ask for it. And hey, guess what? You can start it. I don't know. I know a guy who is, I know two guys, as a matter of fact, one in California in Orange County and one up here in the Rockford Diocese who lead a program called That Man Is You. Maybe you don't have a men's program. They get together at 645 on a Saturday and they bolt out of there. So they got plenty of time to do the quote unquote honeydew list, right? But it's men on the journey, supporting men. You can start your own women's group. Maybe there's a single women or a widowed group or something that in your community, if you don't have it, start it. I'm, I'm just kind of going beyond what we have control in, meaning in our own lives, in our own homes. But we have to work on ourselves because we need to love all those people exactly the way that they are. And sometimes it's really hard because we, we want to love them when they get to the other side, when they see what they're doing is wrong, when they apologize, when they change course, when they realize, oh my gosh, God's the answer. Well, you know what? <laughs> You might be waiting a really long time. For me, 42 years was before I really know, knew who God was. And then 45, 46, and I'm still working on it being 51. Not as much dabbling in those mortal sins, but there's still temptation all over the place. It doesn't go away, but it's easier to walk away. But that's because I've allowed God in and I've really put my pride to the side. And pride is one of the things that we need to bring to confession every single time we go. Because we always 
overrule what God wants us to do. We just don't love like he wants us to love. We don't accept people. We gossip. Did you know, and I'll remind you, that gossip is the last snare of the devil. Let's remember, <laughs> we might be in eternal life, right? With, with Jesus in heaven. We might. <laughs> so let's look at ourselves. Let's look at the plank in our own eye, not the sliver, the speck in whoever else's eye, because that is the only answer. We cannot change other people. We only have authority over our bodies, our souls, and our relationship with God. And if one of those is not first and foremost, if we don't realize that everything that we have, that we say, that we think, that we do is a blessing from God or it's a grace in our life, how we look, what our personality is like, what our charisms are, if we forget that God made us exactly the way that we are right now and loves us exactly the way we are. Let's not forget the most important part of that. We can't just forget that because we have to forget, we can't forget, I should say, that he loves us so much, he doesn't want us to stay this way. That's why it's called a journey. We never get there. We never arrive until we are dead. And then the real journey starts. Where are we going to end? Because we might have eternal life with Jesus in heaven, <laughs> right? So let's get our heads out of you know where. And let's go look at that mirror ourselves. Walk to the thing. Walk and look at your face. How often do we walk away from that mirror thinking we look like something else? Maybe even believing the facade that we put out there. When we know I've got a lot of work to do on me to love and accept me and to love and accept others exactly where they are and to have courage to speak truth, but not in judgment, in love. And you can't do that without God giving you those words and moving your faith from your head down to your heart. Because when that happens, the words are different. The words are much, much different. You aren't just quoting chapter and verse of the Bible, you are vulnerably speaking to someone and also sharing your life with that person. That is why I believe, honestly, God allowed so much the horrific living for me. And I had what I would call a pretty good life. Honestly, I don't look back on my life and think, oh, what, what a horrible upbringing I had. What an abusive life I had. I don't. But I look and I say, wow, because of the lack of speaking about God and speaking about how everything belongs to him, I mean, that never came up. So sure. That shaped who I was. I'm grateful I didn't have parents that physically hurt me or that verbally abused me. I didn't have the most loving, affectionate parents that, you know, showed love. 
I had a couple of brothers who were like the ones they focused on because they were going to be professional hockey players and I got left in the back, but I really didn't feel totally ignored. And sometimes I liked it because then they would leave for the weekend and I could have a big party at the house, right? I was okay doing my own thing, but ultimately that shaped my insecurity that made me feel so uncomfortable in my own skin, which is normal. Every single person, especially when you're in high school or junior high, when you're going through those awkward stages of who am I? What is happening to my body? What is happening to my feelings? I don't think anyone likes me and all you want is for people to like you. It's an overwhelming, underpinning kind of thing that ever it's a, it's a, gosh, I did, dare I say it's a universal feeling. And anyone who came across think coming across like, oh, I'm so confident in myself or they're always so nice and so smiley and so confident in who they are. I want to be like that person. I'm sure they're shaking in their boots on the inside too. And that doesn't necessarily go away as you grow older. I remember I would be walking in to a huge conference or I would be speaking on a stage about IT, right? Wondering, oh, do these people even get it? Is my message coming across? Do they like me? Same thing when I'm in, you know, my office. Am I doing a good job? When are they going to figure it out that I don't really know what I'm doing? Like it got worse as I got older. And so I started using drugs and using other things to numb that. And that's why I believe God gave me all of these experiences so that when I speak to someone, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a presentation or even on a podcast, I can relate my life to them. Maybe I'm not going to have some sort of conversation about me wondering if I was a boy or a girl because I don't believe that that agenda was pushed on me when I was that age. Not yet. What I was fearful of, of, of was my parents getting divorced because that was starting to come out. And I had a friend who was one of the first people I knew that had a divorced parents. And yeah, you kind of sit there and you're a little bit scared about that. But I'm telling you, if I had this transgender thing shoved down my throat at that age, I was a tomboy. I didn't play with dolls. I didn't wear dresses. I had not one Barbie in my house. I wasn't really a girly girl. I didn't wear makeup and I didn't do all these things. Could I have been convinced through the world and the media and the commercials and the kids programming that maybe, just maybe because I wasn't comfortable in my skin, I should be a boy? I'm pretty sure I could have easily fell into that. So how do I have a conversation with someone who is going through that? Well, I'll tell you, I never felt good in my own skin. I tried to be something I wasn't. I became bulimic. I was trying to change my physical outside by putting myself through this horrific experience of the inside of my body. Eating and throwing up, eating and throwing up. Starving myself in a way yet going through a, a blood sugar high, a blood sugar low, and honestly doing what my body is not supposed to do, which is throwing up the food and not digesting the food. I mean, I was pretty much bastardizing my body, perverting what my body normally does. I could also share the fact that from a sexual standpoint, being heterosexual, 
I gave myself up a lot, whether I really liked the guy or not. Okay, anyway, I just want to say that being vulnerable and being loving and being open and honest and raw with someone when you're trying to talk about something like that or something else, right? Maybe they're addicted to something or maybe they're doing things that are not healthy, right? Sleeping around, doing drugs, watching porn. Like, how do you talk to people? Well, you share your problems <laughs> as well. I just think that people need to understand that you are a work in progress and, and where God has worked in you and how God has helped you. It really helps that person relate to you especially if you're some sort of parental authority to them, right? An aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad. And I think a lot of the time we don't show our own brokenness and our own wounds because people are attracted to real people. Honestly, you all know, I say this often, that is why I do what I do. Because when I was on the journey, I didn't have someone who said the things that I did. At least I didn't find them very frequently. I know that there are people out there who have had these lives and who have shared them, but perhaps forget to bring that back up to people, right? Like, hey, I've been there, done that. Not just where do you go after you get this beautiful grace and these blessings from God to go buy, you know, to change that part of your life. I shouldn't say go buy it because and a lot of times you go right at it. <laughs> you don't skirt around it. Okay. Bottom line, work on you forget everybody else forget everybody else because we need to get closer to God so that we can live those two greatest commandments because the more we allow God to raise up to our eyes what we need to work on because he does every day we can just take peace that he will make those changes that he will also work with our prayers if it's his will. We can continue to pray for those in our lives. We shouldn't stop, right? It's a process. We don't know God's timing. We don't know his ways. But if we're patient and persistent, who knows that answer, the one of the three, yes, yes, not now though, or no, will be known to us. And most of the time, especially when we're praying for conversion, it's yes, but not now. Because something's work being worked on. You or that person isn't ready. Or the people in both of your lives aren't ready for that change yet. I know darn well that's why God hasn't completely healed things in my life. Because I'm not ready to take that easy way out, I need to struggle a little bit more through this. I need to do practice what I preach, right? To go to him more and to call out on him, call out for him instead of relying on myself, that pride again. Okay, we've got the garbage man coming, so I'm going to wrap up. I'm in the closet now. <laughs> okay, work on yourself. There will be no regret, I promise you. You will not sit there and say, boy, I really wish I didn't spend all that time trying to deepen my relationship with God. What a waste that was. No words come out of anyone's mouth who has taken those steps to learn how to pray, 
to get closer to God, to deliver spirits, right? To call on the Lord and know that, wait a minute, I don't need to feel this way. This is a feeling. This is emotion. And this is fleeting. We are emotional idiots. And if we keep falling into the emotions, the minute we get anxious or worried or frustrated or angry, you got to know you can stop it and you can get rid of it in the power of Jesus. And think about how that makes you a better person, a better spouse, a better friend, a better mom, dad, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa, right? I mean, co-worker, just a stranger out there, you know, you're going to be smiling and saying hi to people. You're not just going to sit and be in your own little world. You're going to want to bring love out there. And that is what people need so badly today. We can see it everywhere. So I love you. You go be loved today. Find something more with God and have a blessed and inspired day.